false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. God is keeping track of Shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Proverbs 19:5. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth in collaboration in today again with uh, Brett Norman from the United States of America, my brother in Christ who um, did along with me the whole of this reading, uh, I think almost every part or even every part of it, of uh, Peter was never in Rome, Simon Peter meets the competition. Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. This is the 16th part today on Sunday the 30th of September 2018 where we met on 4 o'clock in my afternoon and 9 o'clock in the morning at Brett's time and I very welcome, very warmly welcome Brett to the broadcast. Hello brother, how are you doing? Everything all right there? Just fine, yes. Things are going great, Eric, and thank you for inviting me. And yes, I have been with you on every single recording of this reading so far. Yeah, I think that it was, I know of. It, uh, I think it was just the very first one that I did on my own, and from the second. Oh one, yeah, one the you introduction. Were That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, you did. Yep, and we even thought about doing uh, doing those where you would just send them to me, and I would I would add comments as needed. But it's so much better to be with you. Yeah, it is. It is. Being accompanied by a brother in Christ is the wonderful way to do these recordings. Sure is. Um, I know it's, it's it's also interesting to do your readings when you are alone, like Tom Fress is, but on the other hand, I very much appreciate the company of good brothers in Christ like you and Michael. Michael, who couldn't join us again today because he still takes care of his... Uh, 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 what is that? Stepdaughter? Can you say? Yes. Stepdaughter? Mm -hmm. Is that the right expression that makes in English? Sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the uh, the daughter of his ex-girlfriend, let's say, uh, probably giving her a, a good time. She's eleven, and they're gonna have some fun time with his ferrets and all that stuff, and that's wonderful oh, for him. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful for him and for her. But we are going to read Ernest L. Martin's last pages, probably the last broadcast today. I don't know. I can't look into the future. I know we have about three pages left. Sometimes that's enough for one recording. Sometimes that's enough for two or three. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say three. <laughs> yeah. So let's just see where the spirit takes us, Brett. Okay. And I'm let's ready. start. On page 31, we started, we, uh, we finished yesterday. We were going into the review. This is the... Yeah, the review of all that we have seen so far and a compilation of everything and especially um, in regards to the book of Revelation as we will see later on. <coughs> By the way, I was looking for a picture of the author, Ernest L. Martin, so um, I, I searched out this picture so you have a picture that you can point on the one who wrote this one. Uh, when you go to Wikipedia and have a look at his works that he did, uh, this work that we are reading right here is not even mentioned and this is uh, very often with authors like these they are famous quote-unquote famous for something and uh, the other work that is not so much famous is much more interesting because <laughs> you know yeah I'm just looking at this work that he did and I'm not going to read any any, any other of his work at least not in the near future but uh, by the way I think he uh, he um, he deceased in the meantime, I'm not sure, but I, I, mm -hmm. I think so. Um, anyway, let's go right to the book, uh, Simon uh, the Sorcerer, or Simon Peter meets Simon Magus. Peter was never in Rome. That's the very important message that we have to get here. 
that's why the videos are called uh, the Simonian system you know and yesterday I found a very nice title for that I don't remember anymore I deleted that that I have the right text here but okay let's go into this without any further ado with the foregoing so that's all the stuff that we just did did not just read in the last broadcast the 15th but also all the other broadcasts here before with all that foregoing in mind let us now go back to the two identifying scriptures in Revelation. The whole matter becomes so plain when the key about Simon Magus and the Samaritan Christian heresy is realized. And now we quote from the King James Version Revelation chapter 3 verse 9, quote, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which is inspired by Satan himself, that is added to the Bible of course, as you can see in the brackets, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. Okay. The synagogue of Satan are those Samaritan Christians, the followers of Simon Magus. Samaritan Christians today we can call them Catholic Christians. The synagogue of Satan are those Catholic Christians followers of Simon Magus. The phrase which they say uh, which say they are Jews and are not but do lie could easily be set off by brackets for that is the way John intended it. He meant only one people the quote unquote Christian the Catholic Samaritans. Now the other churches of Revelation 2 and 3 speaking about chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, of course. When we now look at the other indications about this heretical system, the Simon Magus and his followers' identification becomes exact, means there is no doubt about their identifications. Huh? When we now look at the other indications about this heretical system, the Simon Magus and his followers' identification becomes faultless. Look, for example, at the Ephesus church era. Notice the group they had to counter. Quote, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Unquote. As we can read in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. Now, if we let the Bible be our guide, and don't understand me wrong, <laughs> uh, scrap the word if, always let the Bible be your guide, <laughs> okay? Yes. But of course, Ernest L. Martin is speaking to everyone here, everyone who is very often looking and seeking for these answers or answers to these questions in the secular world. And in the secular world you will never find the truth because the secular world is ruled by heathen, ruled by pagans, yeah? ruled by biblical heretics. Yeah? Very important point to make the point of biblical heretics. Let me just take a sip of my coffee, excuse me. Sure, yes. Now, if we let the Bible be our guides, we always let the Bible be our guides. Now we let the Bible be our guides in understanding this matter. And then it shows only one man who heretically sought an apostleship and never repented of his desire to buy that office. Not only to have, as the author says, but to buy that office. Committing the sin of simony. It was Simon Magus. History shows us that Simon established his own Christianity with his own apostles. We call that today Roman Catholicism. Now we let the Bible be our guide and understand the matter where it clearly shows only one man who heretically sought an apostleship and who never repented of his desire to buy that apostleship office. That person was Simon Magus, recorded in the Bible in Acts chapter 8. And the following history shows us that this Simon established his Roman Catholicism with his own apostles. 
this is how I love to read the sentence. And mm. also, notice, notice this important point. Compare the statements about the Samaritans, quote, from Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. That's Revelation 3, verse 9. With our present scripture under discussion, which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That's Revelation 2, verse 2. The only difference are the words Jews and apostles. But, a very, very important but, here, if we get the point at which John is driving, he is saying that these people were calling themselves Jewish apostles, but that they were all liars. Now we come to an interesting part, the female counterpart of Simon. Probably never heard about that before, right? No. Nope. Now it's well known that the history of Simon and his religion is connected with the old Babylonian idea of the male and female religious principle. Simon's Helen, who is Semiramis, figured high in his system. Semiramis. This picture here gives us a picture of Semiramis on the, at the side of Nimrod, yeah, who was a mighty hunter before the Lord. A mighty hunter of souls, that is to be understood. The first man who built a city with walls to quote-unquote protect the people from the wild animals, but on the other hand, also to control the people within the walls they build. Exactly like it is today. You know, when they sell to you this joke of, oh, for more security we need to have cameras everywhere and we need to have this and that just for more security, for more safety, because otherwise the terrorists will get you. Hmm? Yeah, Nimrod was the first, in that regard, like American president or something. <laughs> no, actually, yeah. he was the first pope, but that's another, <laughs> that's another story. Anyway, it's well known that the history of Simon and his religion is connected with the old Babylonian idea of male and female religious principles, and Simon's Helen, alias Semiramis, figured high in his system. It would seem odd if the book of Revelation didn't mention something of the female side of the false system. However, Christ seems to emphasize the male portion of the system in six of the church eras. The genders are all masculine. But, and again, a very important but, when he comes to the Thyatira era, Christ switches remarkably to the female part. Yet, there are not different false systems being discussed, but only the various divisions of the one system, meaning that one system has female and male identification points. It is when we come to Thyatira that we find the system described under the symbol of a woman, the woman Jezebel. This analogy was deliberately chosen for many obvious reasons. Reasons so plain that John's first century readers could not help but comprehend what he was talking about. I would so much love it, Brett, that our brethren today also could not help but comprehend what we are talking about here in reading this book. Mm -hmm. We must remember that John was writing to seven literal churches, all contemporaneous with one, each, uh, with, with, with one another. So what does that to the theory that the book of Revelation of the seven churches speaks of churches even in our time today in the 21st century. What does that to the theory of the Seventh-day Adventists who call themselves one of these churches? When the author says here very clearly, as the Bible intended it to be understood, that we must remember that John was writing to seven literal churches, all contemporaneous with one another. 
and of those churches who were existing in the first and second and third century, there is none left. Because the big, the great falling away came, you know. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep, you got it. You're not one, yeah, not one of these seven churches is still in existence today. <sighs> right, that behind your ears, you Seventh Day Adventist. <laughs> There's some history for you. <laughs> There's some history for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you want to study history. Seventh Day Adventists have been so good at that. Why don't they mention that, huh? Well, because they are also responsible for the things they don't say, not also for the things they say. And oh, people, yeah. That's and people right. always measure the Seventh Day Adventists on the things they say, and they never measure them on the things they do not say. Huh? So we must remember that John was writing to seven literal churches, all contemporaneous with one another, and he was using language or symbols with which they were acquainted. We, of course, realize the prophetic meaning of the seven churches, but we know that John also had distinct and pertinent messages to the seven congregations which existed in his day. By keeping this obvious fact in mind, the real truth of what John was talking about is made clear to us today. Again, I gotta take a sip of my coffee. Excuse me, but I don't want to let it get yeah, cold because cold coffee fine. is really disgusting. Yeah, the real truth of what John was talking about is made clear to us today. I think in the Bible, in uh, the Law and the Prophets, it speaks of in the latter days you shall, uh, you shall. Uh, Oh, how does the wording go? I can't remember that word now. Um, but you'll see it perfectly, or, or you'll uh, you will uh, vision it perfectly, or ah, knowledge not... shall increase, or something like that. Uh, I'll look it up while you're talking. You're kind of yeah, all... okay. Good idea. Give you a comment here. To... Good. Now, while I'm talking, okay, I'm just reading about this uh, prostitute prophetess that oh, yes. Ernest Martin speaks about. In Revelation 2, verse 20. And um, I made a little comment on that. So, let's see Please what the do. author and I have to say here on the prostitute prophetess. First, we notice that John says this Jezebel called herself a prophetess. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's the comment that I didn't want to mention. <laughs> mm. About the Seventh-day Adventist again, you know, because mm -hmm. they revere this Ellen G. White as a prophetess. Now, I don't want to compare Ellen G. White to Jezebel. That's probably going a little bit too far. But anybody can do his own studies <laughs> and see what he's making of that. Yeah. But um, anyway, we first notice that John says this Jezebel called herself a prophetess, as we can read in Revelation 2, verse 20. Okay, so Revelation 2, verse 20, where is that? I have the Bible, online Bible open here, Revelation 2, verse 20, and there we read, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Okay? Now, we first notice that John says this Jezebel called herself a prophetess in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. There must have been a particular false prophetess which had caused God's servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. By looking on this Jezebel as having been contemporaneous with all the heresies of the other churches, and that these heresies were in reality only one false system, which originated with Simon Magus, we can then easily see that this Jezebel can be equated with the female principle which Simon introduced into his quote-unquote Christianity, Roman Catholicism, we should read. None other than Simon's Helen, the reclaimed temple prostitute from Tyre. Helen was a prostitute. What better type of person is there? Who could so perfect, so ex expertly teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, 
literally as well as spiritually. Simon Magus came in contact with the priestess of Tyre who had been a temple prostitute. The Samaritans worshipped Suck of Binath, who was the goddess Venus. Her devotees continually prostituted themselves. It was their religious duty to do so. This woman was overawed by Simon's demonic power and was persuaded to follow him, to live with him, to become the female principal, the necessary counterpart to his claim as being a type of male deity. You remember uh, his claim of being a male deity, you remember that the Roman Emperor even built a statue of Simon Magus' deity in Rome at one of the islands. We spoke about that before. Yeah? So it is Simon Magus who claimed to be deity and he needed a female counterpart like you have Nimrod and Semiribus in the past. Okay? He is making himself Nimrod revived. That's what you have to understand from this. Now, relative to this, the Encyclopedia Britannica in volume 25 on page 126 quotes from Justin and states, And almost all the Samaritans and a few among the other nations acknowledge and adore him, speaking of Simon Magus, as the first god. And one Helen who went about with him at the time, who before had had her stand in a brothel, they say was the first thought that was brought into being by him. Unquote. Now this is interesting because Justin was himself a, cemetery, a Samaritan, born and reared in the country. He certainly knew his people's native traditions and teachings. What he says agrees exactly with the New Testament revelation of how the Samaritans regarded Simon. They actually called him the great power of God, as we have read numerous times already in Acts chapter 8 verse 10. It is because of this that they believed him to have creative powers. He himself said he created Helen, his female companion, whom he later elevated to a goddess. Now from the Dictionary of Religion of Ethics, volume 11, page 570, we read, quote, Irenaeus, Theodoret and Epiphanius agree in identifying Simon with the supreme god and Helena with the Enoia, the first conception of his mind and his agent in creation, unquote. What blasphemy! But this is what we taught everywhere. He, what he taught everywhere he went, and under the guise of Christianity, as the Roman Catholic Church teaches the same thing today under the guise of Christianity, and therefore, the Roman Catholicism is not Christianity, but is a posted Roman Christianity. Not the literal Christianity. It's a post. It's Babylonian teaching. I mean, let's call a spade a spade, right? Right. I've got a comment when you're ready here. Please. Okay. So uh, I had done a study in Jeremiah uh, some years ago, and uh, it just kept sticking in my mind uh, this uh, this one uh, verse. And it has to do with uh, with prophecy. Of course, Jeremiah was a prophet, and uh, oh, I don't even think I can go into too much detail of this because it's very deep right now, and it's early here. <laughs> I haven't quite got the the umph to do it behind me right now. Well, but, I can uh, read it for you if you want to. If you tell me where sure. in Jeremiah, I have to look it up. It's Jeremiah chapter twenty-three, verse twenty. Okay. Let's go to Jeremiah 23. Uh, yes, 23, verse 20. Verse 20, okay. Jeremiah 23, verse 20. The King James Bible says, The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed 
until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. Shall I go on? No, that's all I wanted to say because, well, you can if you'd like. Uh, this whole chapter is really something. Yeah, okay, actually. but reading now the whole chapter is a little yeah. bit too far off, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. This is a very deep study, actually, for, for anyone wanting to really get into their Bible. I highly recommend the book of Jeremiah. It's amazing. Along with Isaiah, too. Both those books are really something. Lots of oomph. So your That's point good. you're making in regard to the reading that we are doing right now is what? Well, we were on that previous paragraph there, and uh, I'm sorry, you're kid. I had uh, I've lost it. <laughs> <laughs> you lost it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have it in front of me. So. Okay, then let's just continue in the reading here, and try to pick it up where we were. Uh, what blasphemy, the author says. But this is what he taught everywhere. He went and under the guise of Christianity. Now, typically pagan. There always had to be the man and woman divinities in paganism, yeah? like Semiramis and Nimrod. Or, to make it plain, Nimrod and Semiramis. Okay, should have read a little bit for that. <laughs> Now notice what the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics says about this teaching of Simon, which he took to Rome and they accepted. Quote, the original of Simon's Helena is the moon goddess of Syria and Babylonia. Unquote. In the Clementine recognitions, Helena is always translated Luna, and that stands for the moon. The theory that Simon was accustomed to borrow from paganism is corroborated by the assertion of the fathers that he and Helena were worshipped by their sect as the attributes of Zeus and Athene, and received the cult title Lord and Lady, i.e. Our Lord and Our Lady, which we can read from the same uh, source, Encyclopedia of Religions and Ethics. As stated before, it was Simon's plan to bring about a universal religion under the powerful name of Christianity. Now, this is exactly what Roman Catholicism is to this day, the 30th of September 2018, right, Brad? Yeah, that's right. It was Simon's plan to bring about a universal means Catholic religion under the powerful name of Christianity, and that's what they did. Now remember that Simon never gave up the Christian name. Well, like the Roman Catholic Church teaches of the Christian name of Jesus, but they mean another. When the Roman Catholic Church teaches Jesus, she means Tammuz. Yeah? When she preaches the uh, Virgin Mary, she means the Queen of Heaven, which is another derivative of Semiramis. Yeah? Of course, not even going into the false worship of the quote-unquote Virgin Mary, who was not a virgin after J uh, Jesus was born, because then she consumed the marriage with Joseph and bore at least six other children, as we know from the Bible. So, she was not a perpetual virgin, and she was not born uh, sinless, and and all that stuff. But not going too deep, and uh, not going too uh, too far away from the subject we're, we're on here. It is really a very important sentence, the one that I will put in color right here, right now, uh, that we can that it jumps a little bit into the eye, yeah. in nice green color, that we understand. It was Simon's plan to bring about a universal religion under the powerful name of Christianity. That is exactly what Roman Catholicism is since more than 1500 years today. You have a comment there, Brad? Yeah, well, you know, I, it was uh, kind of bugging me there that I couldn't finish my point uh, on that okay. last comment. And uh, I just pulled up the PDF and I'm looking at it now. And, um, you know, it's really about this this whole like this whole Babylonian structure 
that's been reestablished here in America and the coming, the pending judgment upon this nation as a whole, not individually, so, so to speak, but as a whole, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's looming. I mean, it's, it could take a long time. Who knows, Yerk? I have no idea. None of us know. Uh, it says right in the Bible, no man knows the day or the hour, you know, when the Lord will return, when he shall return. Right. And divide the sheep from the goats. But uh, there's a lot. And separate the chaff from yes. the wheat. That's right. Separate the chaff from the wheat. Like on the uh, threshing floor in Daniel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Bible points to all kinds of things and and one of the things about Jeremiah is this judgment that comes in the latter days and that's what that verse is all about you shall consider it or you shall consider it perfectly you shall see it perfectly because you know these things are going to come to a peak I believe at some point uh, if we're not getting close already I don't know um, it sure seems like we are here mm-hmm yeah, it says very clearly in the beginning of the verse, the anger of the Lord shall not return until he yes. has executed. When, when Jesus Christ returns, it is not only full of love for his bride that he will take out of this world, but it is also full of anger at yep. all the pagans in this world who did not adhere to his teaching. Yep, in Psalms it says, he shall vex them in his sore displeasure not going to be happy because he's trying to give them a chance to repent I would imagine but uh, you know the enemy cannot repent many of them they're fully taken they don't have it written in their heart to repent that's right that's right and we have written in our hearts the law of our God that's why we listen to the Holy Spirit, that's why we listen to God, and that's why we worship Him as He asks of us, and not in another way, not in our own way. We respect yep, and that's why the world will persecute us at, at the appointed time, when, sure. uh, when it is uh, politically correct to do so, and I believe that's coming. That is on the threshold. Yeah, I I'd think say. so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. Yep, the digital world is almost ready. It's all prepared. It's been waiting for a long time. So, that's it, Yerk. Good. Then we're going to continue. And I can't repeat the sentence often enough. As stated before, it was Simon's plan to bring about a universal religion under the powerful name of Christianity. Or it was Simon's plan to bring about a Catholic religion under the powerful name of Roman Catholicism. Remember that Simon never gave up his Christian or the Christian name. His followers were called Christians, as Roman Catholics are called Christians today. In amalgamating the pagan Babylonian religious beliefs with Christianity, he placed himself at the head the personification of the chief pagan gods of old, and Helena as his companion in creation, the personification of the female deities. The name Helena for his consort fit his plan exceptionally well. There existed, we read in another quote from the same book, Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, There existed a widespread cult of the moon goddess in Syria and Egypt, under the name Helene. She was identified with Aphrodite, with Atargatis, and the Egyptian Isis, who was after uh, uh, after represented with horns to betoken her relation to the moon. One feature of the myth of Helen can be traced to the very ancient connection of the religion of Osiris with Syria. According to legend, Isis spent ten years at a brothel in Tyre 
during the course of her wanderings in search of the scattered limbs of her husband. The imprisonment of Helen, means Simon's Helen, is then only a variant of the many myths relating the degradation of the Queen of Heaven. Unquote. Now, we are going a little bit into Egyptian mythology here. According to the legend, Isis spent ten years in a brothel during the course of her wandering, searching the scattered limbs of her husbands. That is the same thing that Semiramis did when she was looking for the hacked up body parts of her husband Nimrod, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same story all over again. It comes down from Babylon and it also went down in Egypt. And the Egyptian Isis Horus Seth is the same as the Babylonian Nimrod, Semiramis and Tammuz. That's something that you have to understand. They only give it other names, but it is the same story. And when Isis went searching um, years for looking for the scattered limbs of her husband, who was hacked into pieces, that's the same when Semiramis did that with Nimrod looking for that. And what's the one part they did not find? Well, that's the one that they erect all over the world in a phallus form. They, what we call today, obelisks. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, how important these observations are for Osiris was clearly Nimrod and Isis was Semiramis. Exactly as I just told you. I didn't know the author was saying that here. I did, couldn't read that page. <laughs> Thus, Simon Magus said that he had been the power that motivated Nimrod and that Helen was Semiramis, the Queen of Heaven. Now let us carefully note that Simon brought his female principal from the city of Tyre. And who was the original Jezebel, the woman who seduced Israel to worship Baal? She was the daughter of the king of the Sidonians, whose capital city was Tyre. And therefore we can read 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31, and we will do so in a moment. The original Jezebel was also from Tyre. And not only that, and by the way, we have for this statement of the author here, we have the confirmation of the Bible. We are going to read that in a moment. This is not the author speaking out of his ass. This is pure biblical fact. And we are connecting dots here. The original Jezebel was also from Tyre. And not only that, Helen claimed herself to be the creation of Simon that it was Simon who brought her into existence. We can read that in the Encyclopedia Britannica. She was, in a sense, the daughter of Simon, but the original Jezebel was the literal daughter of the king of Tyre. As we can read 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31, from the King James, quote, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal, in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Do you see the dots connecting itself when you have the Bible, the only available truth in this world, as your foundation? Isn't this just wonderful, Brett? Yes, sure is. And this um, climax of the book of Ernest L. Martin, on we are on the last page already. This climax is really worked on all through the other 15 broadcasts that we are speaking about, to come to this climax of biblical, provable, undeniable, absolute truth. This climax is working to that point. And we will go 
into a last little paragraph called the Gospel of John. Let's take another picture here again of Peter and Simon Magus and the disputation they had in Acts chapter 8 for the closing of this book. With all of these things in mind, everything we read today and everything we read on the earlier 15 broadcasts, we can see why John hits hard at the Samaritans in his Gospel, as well as the book of Revelation. He was the only Gospel writer who mentions the incident of the Samaritan woman at the well. He saw it absolutely necessary by this time for doing so. Now actually, the whole incident at the well is of relative unimportance if it was simply put there to show us that Christ could perceive that the woman had five had had five husbands. Now it comes. But there was much more to it than that. If we will carefully notice what the conversation between the Samaritan woman and Christ was, we will see that John is giving the death blow to the Antichrist system. That is the main important sentence. That John is giving the death blow to the claims of the Christian Samaritans to this day. Of his day, the Antichrist system. John is giving the death blow to the Roman Catholic system even in this day when we read the conversation of Jesus Christ with the Samaritan woman at the well with the understanding that was given us by taking the whole Bible and the explanation of Ernest Martin's book of Simon the Sorcerer and Simon Peter. Okay? John is giving the death blow to the Antichrist system. And the Antichrist system is not some system that is in the far distant future, but it is the papacy all along. And if you don't understand that, well, then you probably didn't watch all the 15 preceding broadcasts of this one anyway. But when you understand that the papacy is the Antichrist, then you already see that John is giving the death blow to the Antichrist system, as does Daniel in his prophecies and as does Paul in many of his epistles, like for example 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. John is giving the death blow to the Antichrist system. This is why I call this the epiphany of the book. We really come to the whole meaning of the book in the very last few sentences. That's why the author continues and says, since these false Christians, that's what Roman Catholics are, since these false Christians did nominally regard Christ as the, or perhaps better, a founder of the Christian Church, John tells them what Jesus informed the Samaritan woman. Ye worship ye know not what. We can read that in John chapter 4 verse 22. Now Christ meant by those words, that the Samaritans were not worshipping the true God at all. They were worshipping something foreign to the God of the Bible. And that foreign to the God of the Bible was the devil. Now, I took a little note here. And that note reads, uh, first let's read that which is printed in bold. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 37 we read, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. So, what did Jesus Christ say here? He worship ye know not what in John 4.22. Christ meant by those words that the Samaritans were not worshipping the true God at all. Neither shall he or shall you, you can change this, yeah, regard the God of his fathers. When you, you are addressing the Samaritans, you are addressing Simon Magus, and you are addressing the Roman Catholic Church, the Antichrist, because in Daniel 11.36 it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of woman, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. He makes himself God. 
that's what the Pope does. Yeah, and Roman Isaiah, Catholic Isaiah can, 14, right? <laughs> is Isaiah 14 comes into fruition, yeah. And yeah, that's, that's what good. the Pope does, because in Roman Catholic canon law, the Pope is regarded as God on earth. And Jesus Christ says that already in John 4.22. Ye worship, ye know not what. Because the Samaritans were not worshipping the true God, the creator God of the Bible at all. They were worshipping something foreign to the God of the Bible, and that was the devil, the father of lies. So we know, we, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. That's what uh, also was uh, written in John 4.22, in the latter part of that, uh, of that verse. Yeah? Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. We know who is the God that we worship. It's our Father who is in heaven. That's yeah, what Jesus Christ says here. Not about pinning the new world order on Jews. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Quite the opposite. Yeah. Now we can see why John saw the necessity of explaining what Christ really said on this matter. Christ said the Jews would give forth salvation, not the Samaritans. And he was even talking to a Samaritan at the time. The Samaritan woman at the well. John put this here primarily to show that Simon Magus, the Samaritans and his followers were in complete error in their grandiose claims. And to further emphasize the true messiahship of Christ, who, by the way, was a Jew, John records that one whole city even of the Samaritans recognized Jesus as the Christ. And that is in John uh, chapter 4 verses 20, 39 through 42. And we can read this right here. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. We are speaking of the woman at the well that Jesus Christ had his dispute with here before. Okay? Many of the Samaritans of that city where that woman lived believed on him for the saying of the woman that had the conversation with Christ on the well, which testified he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. He was showing that some of the people in Simon's own home ground knew that Jesus Christ and the Jews were responsible for salvation and that Jesus was and is the Christ. Now John tells us that the woman Jezebel at the well or the woman at the well had five husbands not the woman Jezebel. John tells us that the woman at the well had five husbands. This is to be taken literally but isn't it remarkable that the original Babylonian tribes, which became the Samaritans, were five in number, and they each brought their false deities with them. Thus, according to the figurative language of the Old Testament, these Samaritans, who claimed to be worshippers of Yahuwah, were in reality, like the woman at the well, committing adultery with five spiritual quote-unquote husbands and that's where the ring closes that's where the puzzle is being completed with the last piece of the puzzle piece of this jigsaw puzzle Simon Peter never was in Rome the Apostle Peter to make sure you understand me correctly 
and Simon Peter the Apostle met his adversary here in the picture Simon Magus the Samaritan who is the real founder and who is the real quote unquote Peter the Roman Catholic Church claims to have apostolic succession of until today. That's the lying teaching of the Roman Catholic Church of the synagogue of Satan. Peter the Apostle never was in Rome and if you need any more proof than these 16 broadcasts we did so far well you should not miss out on the next one when I'm going to read to you again Babylon Mystery Religion Chapter 10 was Peter the first Pope which I already did in the past and the video is right here on my first channel Joggler 66 in the playlist Babylon Mystery Religion was Peter the first Pope you can look it up you can watch it there for yourself or you can come back to the 17th reading of Peter was never in Rome. And with this, I'm going to give it for closing remarks to Brother Brett. Thanks, Jörg. That's really great to be this, this far in the reading and finishing Ernest L. Martin's work today. And looking forward to the next time, Jörg. Yeah, probably next weekend then, Brett, when I'll be yep. seeing you again. And we are going through Babylon Mystery Religion, Chapter 10, to do that reading together. That's a book that I read, uh, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in 2016. So, uh, yeah, two right. or three years ago. Yeah. And I didn't know at the time what I know now. And even though I thought at that moment I know it all. <laughs> <laughs> I knew nothing, and I know now that I know nothing right now, but I know much more now than I did at that time, so probably it's going to be a little bit more interesting to follow that reading next time we come together, and maybe we are a little bit lucky and we have Brother Michael with us also, and we can all three yes. go into that chapter 10 of Babylon Mystery Religion, and that's for the very first time that I'm going to read something again in a video as I've done before, because I've never done that before. But for a completion, okay. for a completion of this series, first we had the 24 pages of the PDF I took from PresenceOfGodMinistry.org to prove already that Peter was not in Rome. Then we had the whole book of Ernest L. Martin, the 34 pages that we completed right now, reading of Simon Peter meets the competition or Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. And now we are going to finish next time with chapter 10 of Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. And thereby we will establish by three witnesses that Simon Peter the Apostle never was in Rome and that the claim of the Roman Catholic Church is based on falsity, is based on a lie. The whole Roman Catholic building is a card house that you just have to blow at and it will tumble into pieces. Come back next time. Until then, Maranatha. Who has